Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz journeyman saxophonist and educator George Garzone. While on a gig in Copenhagen, Denmark, he spoke with Neon Jazz about a long road he has etched through the jazz world. The son of Italian immigrants in Boston, he grew up in a music-rich household that started him well on his way. Over the years, he has gigged with the best in the business, with cats like Joe Lovano, Randy Brecker, Kenny Barron, and so many more. As an educator, he has taught the best in the business these days. Cats like Brantford Marsalis and Joshua Redman. He's a man full of wit, stories, wisdom, and a hell of a good jazz bio. Listen to it and please dig this my friends george thank you for taking a little time with me today i really appreciate it no problem let me go ahead and start off here in beautiful copenhagen talk to me about what about this trip and what's been going on with you lately you know touring like any other jazz musician hopefully does i've been coming here this is like the 17th year and uh you know i play the festival every year with the um a lot of the the Danish guys that are absolutely killing over here. So I've been doing it and, you know, made a lot of friends. And uh, so, you know, this is like the beginning of the touring season for me, which is only this gig, actually. It's very quiet this year, which is great because I've had a lot of time to be home. But, you know, I'm teaching at Berkeley College of Music right now. I'm full-time there. And, you know, I've been working on this concept called the Triadic Chromatic Approach which I'm about to release uh, soon, the augmented and diminished part of it. Um, so, you know, I've been doing a lot in the education through Berkeley and my own playing and just, you know, trying to keep it going like everyone else does. You know, it's pretty intense, but if you do what you need to do, you can stay on top of it, you know. So things have been really good. The students are great. And, uh, you know, people seem to like this craziness that I play. Nice. Yeah, we do for sure. I'm going to start out at, at the beginning of your life here in Boston where you were born and raised. Talk to me a little bit about about growing up there and what music you saw or what jazz influences got you interested in getting into jazz. Well, I came from a musical family of all saxophone players. Uh, they were from Italy and my uncle Rocco came over from Calabria and he started playing the saxophone <clears throat> and taught all of us. And my Uncle Joe played drums, my cousin Bobby played piano. So it was all around me all my life. And, you know, when I was young, I thought everybody played. You know, every family had a bunch of family musicians. It was interesting, you know. And uh, they literally brought me from the beginning. And, you know, when I was nine, I started playing. And my uncle Rocco had a pizza store, a pizza shop, and I, my father would take me every Sunday to learn how to play in, in the back of his pizza shop while he was throwing pizzas, you know, yeah. kind of wild. But um, So then by the time I was 12 or 13, I was able to play weddings with them. And then by the time I graduated from high school, I was able to go to Berkeley because uh, my uncle Rocco knew Joe Viola, who was like the Buddha from the sax department, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, I went for four years. He kept me under his wing. And then that's where I met Galati and Rich Appleman. We formed the Fringe, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, that was the real paving of the way. And, you know, like I really didn't know too many players because um, my family came from like a big band background. So they went to like Duke Ellington and Tom Pacey, but... When I went to Berkeley, I was introduced to every kind of music. I remember the first year in 68, it was like Mahavishnu, uh, Headhunters, Coltrane, Sonny Rollins. It was wild, you know? Yeah. So that place really set me straight. Um, so then, you know, with the band The Fringe, you, you're familiar with the band, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so we, you know, we've been together this year about, I think it's either 42 or 43 years. Uh, so we keep playing, and that band stays together from, because of an un, unknown force that keeps us playing, you know. And now, now, 
uh, Joe Lovano and Kenny Warner are teaching at Berkeley. So they come down and sit in with us. So, and Berganzi plays the set before us. So on some nights, you can have the whole crowd down there playing. But sometimes, man, I don't even play. I just kind of kick back and listen to these guys go for it, you know? Yeah. Because such high level. So the, but this Monday night thing in Boston at the Lily Pad is really, it, it's equivalent to New York. I mean, I, I go every Monday to hear Jerry before I play, and, <clears throat> you know, then those cats come down and, we just take it to the moon. That's a long time. I mean, that 42 years, that has to feel like family, something that's kind of woven into your DNA. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I know it's a joke, but no, it's not really a joke, but I call us like the Rolling Stones of jazz. Yeah. And, and it's like longer than any of us were married, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, again, we don't, the music is so strong, it just keeps us together. I mean, you can understand being with a group for that long. You go through a lot of ups and downs. And, um, but we toughed it out and got yeah. to this point. And now, you know, it's it's secure. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of commitment that goes beyond even the playing, you know, knowing the people and, you know, going through divorces and deaths of your parents and this and that. And, you know, people come in screaming about this or that, and then the boys get on the bandstand and kick ass, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my my dad grew up in Brooklyn, and, and my grandparents uh, came from Shaka, Sicily, and, and, uh, and, and Naples. And there was things that he talked about being uh, the son of immigrants that was a really big deal. And my question to you is this. Was music a big part of getting woven into the American fabric, or was it a skill that you wanted to get for later on? Was there kind of a, a notion of why music was so important in your family? Well, the, the thing that I saw, Joe, is the love they had for the for playing. <clears throat> I mean, like my uncle, my cousins, they loved playing music so much. It, I mean, I picked up on that when I was young. I was like, wow, these guys are really into it. It wasn't like, oh, we're playing music to, you know, to make money or we're doing it. They had this love for the music. And the first time I saw that outside of my family was Lovano. Yeah. Because um, I was on the road with Tom Jones after Berkeley, and we were in Cleveland. He picked me up, and I went to his house on a Sunday afternoon and I'm telling you, man, it was this stereotype Italian situation, identical to like myself. I walk in, I open the door, and I smell spaghetti sauce cooking, right? <laughs> yep. And it was, we sit down, we eat, and all these, you know, whole thing. And then I was like, oh, man, let's go lay down and watch TV. He's like, no, we're going to go downstairs. And I got to be, I got a chance to be sandwiched in between Joe's dad, Big T, and Joe. And they just kicked my butt. I, because when I was younger, I wasn't playing too strong, but it was eye-opening. But again, the love that I saw that they had for the playing was similar to my family, you know? So, I don't know. What I what I saw out of it was how much people are into playing. Like, my family, they loved it. And then when I met Kalati, he's the same way. He just loves to play. This guy practices a lot. He's always, he's about the music. And I, I really grew to understand what that was about, you know. It was yeah. about the music. You know, some people play, you know, they sound good and they do it, but other people are <clears throat> all about the music. That was something I had to learn quick, you know, because, you know, hanging out with Lovano, Kenny Warner, Billy Drews and these cats, you know, these guys were playing for keeps, yeah. you know. And uh, then I got to know Brecker and Tyberi. You know, these guys were monsters, man. So I knew there was like a level that I had to maintain to be able to play up to them. You know, playing with cats like that throughout the years, I mean, you're, the list from Berganzi to Brecker to Bob Moses, Kenny Barron, the list goes on and on and on. What, what, how much did being around that level of talent teach you as a musician and even as a human being? What did all that mean to you? It made me realize this one word that 
I think the the cats that know understand, and it's called consistency. You know, being able to maintain this high level all the time. And that's what I try to teach the students. You know, you can be a young monster at 18 or 19, but talk to me when you're 30 or 35, you know. And that's where we lose a lot of people. So the word I like to use is consistency because as you get older, people get better and better. You know, you get on the bandstand with Romano, man, it will blow you right away because that's the way he plays, you know. Yeah. So I think the big key, if you're going to talk to musicians and tell them anything, I'm I'm saying that being consistent in your playing, you got to practice every day. If you're going to get on the bandstand with Paganzi or Lovano, and, you know, you know, you gotta you gotta practice every day. You gotta be practicing things that are gonna keep you consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Before we leave kind of the younger realm, early years of your life, let me ask you, when you were growing up, did you what were, what were your dreams of becoming later on? Was it music or was there something else that you were dreaming of becoming? That's deep you say that, Joe. Well, the two options were um music of course, but then I came from a family of chefs and cooks, and these guys could cook their brains out. So I figured, well, if I don't make it in music, I'll go to cooking school. Yeah. I mean, I was caught between three things in 68. It was music, cooking school, and Vietnam. Yeah. And and I remember Lovano and myself and and Billy Drews and Kenny Warner sitting around the TV in the little rec room at Berkeley while they were calling numbers for a lot of the people that were going, you know? Wow. Um, it was pretty scary, but yeah. I didn't, luckily I didn't get called, you know, but, um, I was really, I loved cooking and I was going to go to cooking school to do that if the music didn't work out, but I'm glad I didn't because as I met chefs in my life and people that own restaurants, it's a completely insane business. Yeah. I mean, like nuts. I mean, you think musicians are nuts. These guys are completely <laughs> off the wall. I've I've lived it. Yeah, I've I've seen it for sure. Um, you know, you've had so many periods of your life of just like you said, consistency and prolific creativity. If you look back on your life, is there one period where you think, "My God, I was creating at a level that's crazy"? Right now. Nice. <laughs> because, well. You know, just in short, I studied with a uh, Zen master in Boston since I was 28. And, you know, he taught us, like, discipline, mind form, meditation, moving form, getting up early, like, five in the morning. And he said later in life after 60 was when you would really excel. And he's right. I mean, I'm hitting these points that I've never felt before uh, because of, I think maturity, you know, playing music as a jazz musician. I mean, all these things you hear, guys are 30 or 40, they sound great. I've taught most of them, Mark Turner, Seamus Blake, Donnie, you know, they sound, I love those guys, they're fabulous. But you cannot, it's unmistakable when you hear people that are blowing from 60 after, you know, Um, like Joe, um, Joe, um, oh my God, I'm spacing um, Sonny Rollins. I mean, even look at um, Lee Cornets and you know all these cats that are like eighty-ish. You know, and they're still to some degree they're still playing. You know. Yeah. You know, I I had the honor of speaking with Sonny Rollins several years ago, and I asked him about his playing, and he said to me in all seriousness, "I'm still waiting to release the best album of my life," and I thought it was the craziest answer. But what you just said makes total sense. There's a level, I think, of nirvana that that, that starts kind of seeping in. Um, and the playing excels to certain points. Look at Coltrane. I mean, he died when he was like 36. And, you know, had he had kept going, I think the face of music would be completely different. Yeah. You know, I mean, what he, laid, he laid down so much before he died. You know, I'm still listening to all that, too, you know? Yeah. Um. Joe Henderson, that's why, you know, cats like that. I mean, it's it's a mature, you can't mistake maturity. It's like good wine, good olive oil. You know, you know the story. You're Italian. You know, it's like 
things that mature are better because they took the time to get to that point. Yeah. You know, I mean, I love the young, I love the young cats. I, I mean, I have students that can go neck and neck and neck with me playing giant steps, and they, you know, they kick butt. But when you listen to them, you know, you can tell there's something missing. It's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, they need to pay their dues. You know, and that's what I'm telling the young guys. You got to pay your dues by being on the planet because people that know what they're listening to. Uh, are aware of that, you know? Yeah. You know, when you look back over your teaching careers, you've taught cats like Branford Marsalis and Joshua Redmond. When you think about how their careers have gone and they've stayed strong all the way up to this point, is that a big point of pride for you to see these players that you taught so early on maturate, stay consistent, and get better over the years? Yeah, well, I mean, they didn't need me to realize what they needed to do to be strong. It's what I was saying, consistency. But I tried to put in their head that if you want to, if you want, if you want to be good, you've got to practice every day and, you know, be consistent. I mean, to hear these guys play, they were all individuals like Mark Turner and Seamus, Donnie, Branford. I love those guys. Listen to those cats, you know. Um, and they, I think, Believe it or not, they tell me all the time. Greg Osby told me, he said, man, we used to come every week to hear you at the Fringe with Jeff Tan. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you know, because they, they were kids back then, and we played in Somerville. So he said, we'd come out in snowstorms just to see you guys. I'm like, I was blown away. Wow. You know? Things. He just said, I was with him in Thailand. He said, yeah, man, we used to go all the way out there, take the subway and shit. You know, I was like, wow, that's deep, you know? Yeah. But I think they realized enough from hearing this group that, or any group, that when you hear something like that on the Coltrane Quartet, um, you know, you've got to be on the case. You can't let up, you know, yeah. ever. Absolutely. So as much good teaching as you've given to the world, i got to ask you, who was one of the most profound teachers in your life? Well, <clears throat> I want to, well, the, the ultimate, the consummate Buddha was Joe Viola because he taught the way I'm teaching now. Let me see if I can explain this to you, Joe. He taught you without teaching you, okay? I mean, you know, we did the Viola books and people will relate. We did the chord studies, the scale studies, but he never talked about improvisation. Like, okay, here's how you play, Right. Yeah. But just sitting next to this guy, even when he wasn't talking, I could feel like I was learning something. He was emitting this aura, you know, mm -hmm. and I lived by that because of what he did for me. I mean, he he was the one that helped me to learn how to play this way. He would never admit it, but he did because he sent it to me in a spiritual way. And that's how I teach my students. I don't give them that much technical stuff. I try to I try to teach them how to teach themselves, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's hard to explain. I mean, I give them things to do, like to try out a concept and this and that, but these guys know that I'm teaching them to a more clairvoyant method, which technically a lot of people wouldn't buy, but I've been teaching at Berkeley 40 years this year. And, yeah. you know, it's a no-brainer that, you know, I'm still there. No one's ever said anything. So, um, you know, these kids I'm training out are really killers. They're really great, you know. Yeah. So I would say Joe Viola and then my Uncle Rocco, because I've got to keep him in the mix because I tortured him to death because I would never practice. I mean, he used to be spinning pizza, and I remember stepping on my foot and screaming at me. And I would have flour all over me because when the pizza came down, it would drop flour on my shirt, you know. Mm -hmm. imagine, imagine remembering that. That's pretty cool, cool you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, some of the best teachers out there are just the jazz albums you've listened to. What jazz albums growing up, what what, what really kind of opened the curtains for you and you were like, wow, this this is it, man. This is, this is the stuff. Well, 
when I was nine and I was just starting to play, my Uncle Frank gave me Reflections by Stan Getz and Swing Into Spring by Benny Goodman. Do you know that record at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, and and I didn't realize my mother had like a, a console, the Zenith console, and I would play Stan Getz over and over and play along with him trying to just learn the melodies, but I didn't realize I was quasi-morphing his sound. Yeah. And so I developed this kind of Stan Getzy sound, and then um, when I went to Berkeley, then I got started in the hip to culture, and then I just took it to another place. Yeah. You know, it's pretty much Stan Getz. I mean, people can hear, like, even in this crazy way that I play, they hear Stan Getz in there. I think it's beautiful, you know, that they... Yeah. Uh, can relate to that, that kind of thing. And speaking of Coltrane, he's come up, and I know how important he has been for you. If you could go back in time and see one of his shows in person, what show would you want to go see? I, will, I would want to see Live at the Half Note or the Showboat. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of any of those where the guy is screaming in the back. He's playing, but and the guy is just going nuts in the audience. Yeah, I, I wish I was there for that. And uh, some of the showboat things, and you know, I would have loved to uh, sat in the studio when he uh, recorded Interstellar Space with Rashid. You know. Yeah. It would be great. Essential. You know, all, all of the records. But he, by the time I got into jazz, he had died like a year before. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He... Yeah, so, you know, I, I missed him by one year, but I, I really listened to him a lot. I mean, there was, there was no other saxophone player that hit me the way he did. I mean, you know, Sonny, Wayne, everyone, Joe, they were all tremendous, but uh, you know, train and sometimes I, you know, like I try to emulate. I don't try to sound like train because you can't. But I just love that pocket, you know. And I'm playing tunes that other people don't do. Yeah. Or they're like Crescent and Wise One, and I want to talk about you. And I'm realizing that cats don't play those tunes because they're too difficult, you know, yeah. to get yeah. that vibe going. Um, and then, you know, I sometimes oh, I just listen to Coltrane. One day I called LeBron, all right, just talking to him. And in the background, I could hear Coltrane playing impressions. That's a, then I was like, I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful, man. Um, for a man that's created so much jazz good in this world through your music and through your education, tell me this. Why do you love jazz? Um you love jazz because jazz loves you. If jazz doesn't love you, you're not going to play jazz. You know, people fight to play jazz. You know, they fight, they go against it. And most most of the time, it might be because the jazz doesn't really like the player. I, li I like jazz because it likes me. I mean, I was fortunate enough to be hit with the good luck stick, meaning... Someone up there is watching over me because, you know, this concept I, that I developed, I developed. No one showed me this triadic concept. There's no one on the planet um, that can say, well, I, that's my concept. I do something like that. People have tried to, but I told them it's not, you know, they're wrong. And, you know, this whole jazz thing is given to you. I, you know, this is my take, Joe. I don't know. I might be wrong, but I think it's decided from a higher force who's going to play and at what levels of playness it comes down. You know, I mean, you can practice your ass off, but I mean, I, I hear people that practice all the time. I mean, they sound good, but they're not doing anything that I would deem as new or innovative, you know? Yeah. So... I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it it picks you. It decides if you know you're good enough. And I, I think it comes from a higher force. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I, I just speculate that. You know, I don't know. Maybe musicians, all the cats, have different views about it. 
But I, you know, I've heard enough kids in school that really practice hard and really don't really get anywhere because yeah. they're not tooling into what they what they need to be doing. You know, it's a drag, but it's what it is. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's pretty. It's, when you don't play like the rest of the planet, um, it's pretty lonely out there. And you know, I've I've only got a few friends that play like this, and one of them just passed. You know, and that Coleman and you know, like Lee, Dave Liedman, you know, he he's chances it all the time, you know. Yeah. And, you know, you sometimes you isolate yourself, you don't get as many gigs because you're not playing that commercial role yeah. that people down, you know. But uh, I, I figure someone's got to do it. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. So yeah. being, being a, a musician that's been all over the world, I'm sure that you've experienced many tasty jazz tales. Is there one that you can tell me that's safe for radio that's just a good old-fashioned jazz story? Like, a, you you mean what kind of jazz story? Like a nasty jazz story? <laughs> well, or no, just just a, a good story. Just something that, that happened when you were on the road or that you experienced while you were playing or out and about. Just a good, good story. All right, I can give you two or three of them. They're fast. I'm not going to go all night. When I played with Tom Jones, and this is really, for me, was big. One night, Elvis came out and sang with us. For me, that was big, because I, I love rock music and all that. And Elvis came and hung with us, you know. <laughs> um, and then one of the biggest gigs... All right, so then I got the gig with George Russell. And, you know, I was still new to New York in the 80s. And we were playing at Sweet Basil. Do you remember that club? Oh yes, yeah. yes. So we we get up, you know, we get up. And we're playing now. It's time for my baritone solo, not tenor. So I pick the horn up, fix the mic, and as I go to play the solo, I look down, and Ornette Coleman is looking right up at me. Wow! And that just blew me away. You know, as I call the guacamole, you know. <laughs> and then, um, then. Uh, I don't know if you see in, on YouTube, uh, the Cold Trade Live in Japan. I got asked to play with Brecker and Liebman, uh, Josh Redman, Jack DeJunette, Joey Cal, and Dave Hall. And, um, yeah. and we went to Japan. And for me, that was a turning point because, you know, at that point in 97, I mean, I, was, I felt cool about my playing, but that was so like high level. I said, man, if I can survive this gig. <laughs> I'm cool, and I did. Right on. And, yeah, and then one more, and then we can start this. Just recently, um, I played a rehearsal with McCoy Tyner because uh, Joe was out of town, so Lebano, so May, Francisco Mela asked me, Joe, you want to come down and play just a rehearsal uh, with McCoy? Absolutely. So I drove all the way from Boston just to make this 45-minute rehearsal. It was, I'm telling you, it was so religious. He came in, and he was the nicest guy in the world, you know? Yeah. So, and, you know, just to experience in front of me and to play, like, a few choruses of, I can't even remember what it was. And that was a high point for me, you know? So, I mean, there's a lot of great high points with the Fringe, playing with Levano, playing with different cats, you know? Yeah. You have a lot of highs, and certain, but I even enjoy playing on Monday night with my band. I mean, every week is always different. These kids come down to hear it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you this. Along the, the route of nostalgia, so to speak, what's the greatest thing about waking up every day? Waking up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like my old man used to say, you know, every day above ground is a good day. Yep. Well, I heard I heard my dad say that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's an old Italian thing, you know. Yeah, um, it is. No, for me, like when I wake up, I have a series of things I do. I go into the train and send send thing and these exercises, and I run. And I'm 65 in September, and you know, I wake up with energy where sometimes a lot of people have trouble waking up period, but I'm glad that I can do that. So it causes me to do what I need to do to have peak performance when I play. But I, I just enjoy life because I have good cats around me, good positive people, you know, 
people that are into what I'm into, even if we don't play, you know, our friends of mine that we go to the casino, I used to live in Las Vegas for 10 years, and, you know, we still go to the casino. Guys want to have a good time, you know, they just want to be social, you know, they're not so concerned about, you know, who's got this gig or that gig. So I like to be around people that are productive and social. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to bring everything down to this final question here, and I want to ask you, when you think back on all of the years and the good that you brought the world through your music and through who you are with teaching and everything, how do you want this world to remember your contribution to jazz and to music and just overall? I want I want them to remember, and all these kids that I taught and anybody that came in touch with me, I want them to remember this line, feel free to feel free. You know what I mean? Like, don't be, afraid. don't be afraid to be free. Feel free to be free. You know, go for it. Don't look back. You know, people will put you down if, you, if you're doing something that's different than what they do, but that's a positive, yeah. you know? And, yeah. you know, I have enough protection around me, you know, with all these people that I know and I've studied to know that what I'm doing is right, you know? Yeah. So, you know, there was a time when people were questioning my whole concept and this and that, but and that was quickly dissolved. So yeah. I just tell people, man, be yourself. And if people don't like you, it's because you've got something good happening. Yep, that's true, man. That's totally true. Yeah. But George, man, it was great to get to know you. Thanks for taking a little time out. It's been It's been a pure pleasure, man. All right, my man. Good luck. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York City, Kansas City, Boston, and spots all over America giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to George for the music he has given to us all and how gracious he was to share his world with us for just a little while. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or you can visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things neon jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.